Welcome to the House of Truth. Today we're beginning our series on the five-fold ministry. And we're going to start kind of from the bottom. We're going to talk about pastors. And that's sort of a continuation from our examination of the governance of, the, of, the governance of a congregation. I'll just be set up. with the. We talked before about the head of the congregation, the pastor, primarily frequently called, and his role as the angel of the church. That is to say, the messenger of the congregation gives the message of the Lord to the congregation. Well, that, well, it is an important part of his role. It's not the entire thing. So today we're, we're, we're going to examine pastors and why their, what their job is, why it's so important, and what happens when they don't do their job. We're going to begin here in Numbers chapter 27, verses 16 to 20. Now, now the Lord, the God of spirits of all flesh, sent a man over the congregation, which may go before them, which may go in before them, which may lead them out, which may bring them in, that the congregation be not as a sheep, as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said to Moses, Take you, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand upon him. And send him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And you shall put some of your honor upon him, that all the congregation of Israel may be obedient. So, so notice the concern. The primary purpose, what? Is to send a man over the congregation. And why? So, so the sheep do not are not going around without, around without a shepherd. And notice the congregation is referred to as sheep. Now, if you don't know anything about sheep, being referred, being compared to sheep is not very complimentary, to be honest. Because the sheep basically are too stupid to take care of themselves. Other, other animals, domesticated animals, can go feral, as it's called, which is got a domesticated animal and gets, it gets away from and, and, and go, starts living out in the wild and his descendants are born not being domesticated and, and grow wild and you know I grew up um, a place called Goat's Bluff they used to have wild goats up there razorbacks, wild hogs dogies, you're hearing cowboy songs, that's wild cattle that's cattle that gone wild and their descendants and they, you know, people round them up you know, round them up to domesticate them mustangs, which are wild horses and Wild, wild dogs, wild cats, like like um, like domesticated cats go wild. All these things can go wild and survive, but you never hear of feral sheep, wild sheep. No, we're not talking about bighorn sheep or something like that. We're talking about domesticated sheep that have gone wild because they simply cannot live without a shepherd. They get scattered all over the place. They if if if, if a sheep falls on its if a, they they're prone to falling on their back and can't get up. And when they do, they'll lay there, kick their legs, and bah. And the other sheep cannot, will not help them get up, can't help them get up often. And they're really just calling to every predator, the dinner bell out there when they're bang. Because they're bang for a shepherd to come rescue them, but there is when there is no shepherd, all it does is attract, attract the things when they kill and eat them. And this is what people are compared to here. The congregation of the Lord is compared to sheep. Without a shepherd, they will not survive. <coughs> and we'll discuss, we'll discuss this in more detail. But notice again, like, like, we look, like we look at the pastor, that Moses lay hands upon him. He's laying his hand upon him. And Eliezer, the priest, and all the congregation, and the congregation, so the congregation recognize that he's the leader. And notice how Moses is the one, is the one that's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna appoint his successor. I mean, really, God appointed him, but Moses, the leader of the congregation, remember his job is to hear the the master of the congregation, the angel of the church, is his job, is to hear the message from the Lord, and tell it to the congregation. And of course, to do that, he has to spend time praying and studying the Word of God. 
so he can then minister the word to the congregation. So, the the pastor, if things are working right, is working right, should be put in place by 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 a previous pastor. Now, when things aren't working right, then, then that of course won't work. Sometimes things have to start over, so to speak, completely. But if a congregation continues to do what it's supposed to, that that's the way it should work. That's the way that's the way it's intended to work. Now we're going to go to Isaiah. 63, 11 through 14, and we're going to read about Moses being a pastor. Did he remember the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought up the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? He led him on the right hand of Moses for his glorious arm, dividing the water before him to make himself an everlasting name. Then they go to the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. As a beast goes down to this valley, the Spirit of the Lord causing the rest, so did you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. You notice he's the shepherd of his flock. The word pastor and the word shepherd are the same word in, he in Hebrew and Greek. Hebrew, Hebrew or Aramaic in the original covenant. In the renewed covenant, of course, is Greek. And the Hebrew word is, is rea. And rea, le, rea it comes from the word to pasture. To, to, to lead something to the pasture so it can eat, you know, so it can eat, to feed it. The Greek word, poimen, means, is related to a Greek word that means to protect. And those two words together kind of give you the real ideal of a shepherd. It, it's to feed the flock and protect the flock. Now, Moses was that shepherd over Israel, was, was that was a shepherd over Israel in the wilderness. And his Holy Spirit was in him. And notice how God, I mean, God is the one who actually divided the water and everything, but God worked through Moses with his glorious hand, with his glorious arm. And this part here about a horse in the wilderness Horses, their eyes are on the sides of their head, and 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 because of this, their their front eyesight is often not as good as, and they can they can they they, they, they can be running along and and there's a hole like a gopher horse and get their leg stuck in it and break their leg and these kind of things. When well, rough areas where, where there's not a good horse path, they may, a person will sometimes have to get off the horse. And lead the horse, because of course we, of course, our eyes are, are set in the front, and our depth perception is much better than that of a horse. And that's what it's talking about. The horse cannot see clearly, so it has to be led. In the same way, the people of God cannot, the congregation cannot see clearly, and they also have to be led at times in the wilderness. In those times, in the, when things are not good, when things are rough. And not and not been smoothed out for them. And notice this last thing that relates to the shepherd and the congregation. That he goes down to the valley to rest. In the valley, where there's plenty of grass and there's not these problems it's in the wilderness, that's where they rest. So that, so that, so this is where Moses was to lead them to a place of rest. And this is so these things are telling us about the job of, of, of course, start Moses and Joshua, which is Yahshua in Hebrew, same as Jesus, and the job of a pastor gives, gives us important things. Now, there's one more. Now, this here's the now we're looking at the job of the pastor, sort of summarized here in Jeremiah 3 15 through 17, what God really wants from pastors. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with my with knowledge and understanding. That shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increase in the land. In those days, says the Lord, they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant, and it shall come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of God, and all the nations shall be gathered into it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk anymore after the imagination of their evil heart. Okay, so what we have here is a promise 
And when this time comes, and all the, and all the nations are gathered to it, is of course Jerusalem is during during the reign of Messiah. But notice Messiah is not going to be pastor over with everyone in the world by himself. There's going to be other pastors, and notice these pastors are according to the heart of God. And why they and what's the job of the pastors? They feed the sheep, the congregation, with knowledge and understanding, knowledge of the word of God, and also understanding, so people will not just hear the word but also understand how to apply it correctly to their lives. And what, and so, so the end result is a relationship, relationship with God that comes about from what? Walking no more after the imagination of their evil heart. They're not going to do those things that are wrong anymore. They're just pleasing to God because the pastors are going to feed them with the knowledge of the word of God and understanding. And that's the job of pastors in, in a nutshell. Now, let's go to Psalms 23. It's a short psalm. We'll read the whole thing. And we're going to start here by looking at, again, the characteristics of a good pastor, which we, as we've been doing. Well, let's just begin. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, thy walk to the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Good, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So notice, remember the word pastor and shepherd are interchangeable. It's the same Hebrew word. This is what we're reading here in Hebrew. And notice the Lord, God Almighty, is ultimately should be our pastor. And th this is very important when we start talking about pastors gone bad, and how and, and, you know and what to do when that when that occurs. He should ultimately be. All of our pastor, our ultimate pastor. Yes, as we just saw, even when Messiah is reigning, he'll have pastors under him to help him. But our ultimate pastor should be him, and we should do what he says. And notice, he causes the lion green pastors. He feeds us. Remember to feed them knowledge and understanding. He leads them aside still waters. See, sheep will not drink out, will not drink out of water that's running like a spring and the shepherd has to not, the shepherd has to find a pool that's relatively still but then the drink out of it. it but otherwise it bubbles up and gets in their nose and stuff and they, or sometimes he'll, he'll take rocks and make a pool make a place to slow the water down kind of on both ends so it pool so it creates a pool for them to drink out of and of course those still waters the waters without the Speaks of not uh, of things being peaceful and calm. He restores your soul. He makes you whole again. And how's that come about? Because he leads you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. The righteous member is doing what's right in the eyes of God. He's going to show you how to do what's right in his eyes. And because you're doing that. Even though when things look bad, even whenever it's the shadow of death and looks, and it looks like imminent certain doom, you're not going to be afraid. Because you know the shepherd is with you. Now his rod is his weapon to fight off the wolves, to fight off the predators. One of his weapons. But the staff is to pull you in when you get off the path. That's why they, they got that little crook in them. And originally, they, they were just a, they were just a, they were just like a, a, a long branch, the little short branch. Then they cut off the short branch to make that crook. They became a little bit more sophisticated later. But that was the ideal to pull the sheep back in who were getting off, pull them back into place where they belong. So you know, that's not, that rod might also be for correction. They may have to whack the sheep on the side once in a while, but it's for the sheep's good to keep it out of trouble. 
And notice, prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Prosper you, even when you're, even when you're surrounded by people who do not want you to prosper. Make sure you're taken care of. And anoint, uh, anoint your head with oil like the Holy Spirit, and your cup runs over. You have more than every, You have more than enough. And it's your mind's clear and thinking right. And the result of all this is goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And at the end, when you're after your life's over, you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The shepherd will take you to his home. So remember, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahweh, the Hebrew letters, me is ultimately our shepherd. And a pastor, a good pastor, is going to emulate him in doing all these things. He's going to do all these things for his congregation as well. Now, Ecclesiastes 12, 10 through 14, we're, we're, we're going to see, we're, we're going to read some more about pastors and, of course, the good pastor, the ultimate pastor. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. And that which was written, what, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished. For making books, there is no end, and much that is a weariness, is a weariness to the, of the flesh. Let's hear the, the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God should bring every work into judgment in every secret thing with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Okay, notice the preacher, a pastor is a preacher. He's not the sore evangelist, but we're talking about the pastors in this case. A preacher, a proclaimer. And what should they be doing? Seeking to find out acceptable words. And that which is written, that which was written is upright. That which is written is the word of God that we're reading from. Words of truth. He's supposed to be giving them, remember, feeding them with knowledge and understanding. Words of truth, feeding them the word of God, not things from pop psychology ecology, or whatever the, you know, the current person, you know, whatever, whatever someone said on Dr. Phil or Oprah or whatever the case may be, or this person or that person, or, you know, or those kind of things at all. But the words of truth, the words of the Bible is what he's to feed them. And these are the words of the wise. And a goad, you know, it is a goad is what is something you you poke an animal with to get it to move along, like an ox goad. And these were the were these words, these words of the wise are the words are the words of is the word of God. And they prompt people to action. And they give them stability. These nails being fastened by masters of the assemblies refers to being stable and something. What, what, when you put when, when you nail when, when you place a nail in a board, it tends to stay there. It holds things together. And where do these words come from? One shepherd. Thus the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord. The preacher's job is to is to preach the words of the Lord, the words of the good shepherd. So we're to admonish that we're to, we're to be admonished by these words. Because there's no end to people making books, and study will wear you out. You cannot even books that are good and right about the Word of God. You could not possibly read them all, and just keep trying to read them will just wear you out. Studying st st um, your body needs exercise, just like it needs food and sleep, and you cannot just be studying all the time. In fact, in fact, at a certain point, you actually won't learn as much while you're studying if you don't get, take time to exercise. It helps keep your mind sharper. So when you do study, but this, but so the answer is not to be studying endlessly, studying other people's books and stuff, but to be studying the Word of God to seek out acceptable words from the Word of God. And what and, and what will that result in? Us realizing we need to keep. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is what 
the pastors, the good pastors, trying to get his congregation to do. And why? Because God, everything we do will be will, will be brought in the judgment. Even those things we think are secret or we think nobody sees, not just bad things you will think people get in the way with, but good things where they where perhaps someone helps somebody and didn't take a selfie or nothing. Perhaps no one even knows. Perhaps not even if you're ever following instructions of Yeshua, when possible, helping people without even telling them that yourselves. Well, they don't even know you're the one that helped them. God sees it all. There's no hiding anything from Yahuwah. Yahweh, 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 however you like. There's no way, there's no hiding this from, 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 from him. And you are going to be rewarded. And this is, this is the message a pastor is, a, is a reinforced to his congregation in various ways, time and time again. And to help them, and help them know how to do the, how to fear God, how to know what God's commandments are to keep them. And to fear him. Now we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 13 through 16, and some more characteristics of a good pastor, uh, of a pastor, what a pastor should be doing things. And where his responsibility ends, for that matter. O oh Lord, the hope of all Israel, all that forsake you shall be ashamed, they sh and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be blessed, saved. For you are my, for you are my praise. Phil, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord that now come? As for me, I have not hearkened from being a pastor to follow you. Near my desire the woeful day that you know. That I can't. That, that which came out of my lips was right before you. Okay, now would you, let's focus on the pastor first. Then we'll look at the, the, the response of the people. The pastor here. The pastor is what? The words that came out of his mouth were right before, before God. He was delivering, this is, this, this Jeremiah is Jeremiah, who Jeremiah is a prophet, a Nevi'im, a seer, a speaker. He, spe he, he speaks God's word. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the prophet in a, in a future lesson, a little more detail. But he's also a pastor. Because why? Now, was he, the, he wasn't, he wasn't, he, he wasn't, uh, so this, the natural, pa the, if things have been done correctly, he wouldn't have been in this position. But, he, but God has inserted him as a pastor to the congregation. And we'll look at why we would do such a thing. Why we put things out of the normal order. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna continue on in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. And we're gonna, we've talked about the good pastors. Now, we've talked about what God expects for pastors, what their purpose is, the, their main job is. And what and, and how they remember they're, the ultimate goal of them is to keep the sheep from being scattered. Well, what about when pastors go bad? We're going to begin examining that right now, and, and the results of that right now here in Jeremiah chapter two, verses eleven through seven through eleven through seven. I mean seven through eleven. I brought you out to a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my inheritance an abomination. The priest is not. I'm sorry, I forgot. I forgot. I got. I forgot another part right here about the response of the of, of Israel. Notice their response. Notice the response, the response of Israel. Now we're going to look at these pastors and look and look and look at the good pastors. 
and what they're and what they're, and what the, what they should be doing according to the word of God, and how they work with the ultimate pastor or shepherd, the Lord Himself. And we're going to look at this in Jeremiah chapter seventeen, verses 30, thirteen through sixteen. O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake you shall be ashamed. Made apart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. And they said unto me, and they shall be all they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow you. Neither have I desired the woeful day. That you know us, you know us, that which came on my lips was right before you. So, uh, so we're going to start again. We're going to start with the pat, the job of the pastor, and we'll, and we'll look at the response of the people. And notice, notice, he did not, he did not hasten from, he did not run away from being a pastor to follow after who? Uh, our shepherd, the Lord. And he didn't desire the woeful day, the day of the day of judgment that was going to come upon that was going to come upon the kingdom of Judah here. And notice this thing about him being a pastor. He was not appointed by men. And the reason is, we'll look at that in a moment, but the reason is God, God went out of the normal order, like we saw of Joshua and Moses, to appoint this man, to appoint this man instead, who was a prophet, which we'll talk about. In another in an upcoming series, what that means, but but he's to give this message, and he did in his message. He's trying to save Israel from destruction. He wasn't sent to destroy them, but to save them. And that which came out of his mouth, out of his lips, was right before the Lord. The word the Lord gave him to speak. But how did Israel respond to him? How the pastor, this pastor is doing everything that's right. This is a good pastor. And what did he say? Well, out of his, they, they, that was their response. They forsake the Lord. And they departed from the pastor. And they're going to be written in the earth. Written in the earth, written down, remembered for their bad deeds. As, a, as, a, as an example of what not to do. And what's going to cause them to do this? Because they because they their, their response to him was to forsake the Lord, the fountain of living waters, the source of every good thing. They did not, and not only that, notice, no, notice, notice their treatment of him. He is asking the Lord to heal. heal. He says, Heal me, Lord, and I'll be healed. Save me, and I'll be saved, for you are my praise. The people are persecuting him. And notice their mocking attitude. Where's the word of the Lord? Let it come now. And the day is no different. In their day, the word of the Lord was, the word of the Lord Jeremiah gave was the thankless job he had was to tell them, God's had it with you, with your behavior. He said you in the law, warned you if you kept doing this, you'd be, you'd be taken out of the land of Israel and scattered. It's coming. He's going to use the Babylonians. And when it comes, Cooperate with them. Don't resist them. And it'll go well with you in the land where they're going to take you. And they're like, well, where are the Babylonians at? It hasn't happened yet, but the Babylonians came. And today it's no different. People, people, people were like, well, Jesus didn't, and, and they came yet, you know. And they act like it was never going to happen because he's not ruling on the earth today. Because they got some imagination that th things actually get much worse if you read the Bible than what they've gotten already. But they but they they had this ideal that he would come and prevent come before things got as bad as they've gotten and so on and so. Forth. And it, it, a lot of things they think that are going to occur in the tribulation, a lot of bad things actually, if you study out how, carefully, happen before the tribulation, lead up to it, which is where we're at today. And there's just this general attitude of. If he, you know, if he's really coming, why isn't he came? Why, if, you know, if, if he's going to bring peace on the earth, why don't we have peace on the earth? Blah, blah, blah. That same mocking attitude that Judah had at that time. And where did this attitude come from? 
it came from the it came from pastors gone bad. And we're gonna read about so read about the effect of pastors gone bad on the congregation, the people. And how they got to this point. And we're gonna start here in Jeremiah chapter two, verse eleven through six. Verses 7 through 11. I brought you into plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. And the priest said, Where is the Lord? And they handed the law and knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Therefore, I will yet plead with you, says the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Pass over the Isles of Katim and see, go into Kedar and consider diligently. See if there be such a thing. Has a nation changed their gods, which are not yet no gods? My people have changed their glory for that which that does not profit. Okay, remember, they reject the words, the, the, the source of living water. And, and when do they do this? When they, when, they, when, they, when they were given health and wealth, when they were brought into a plentiful country and eat, and everything was good. And this is not, is this not a picture of America? We, sing, we have songs, America the Beautiful. Uh, you know, uh, in other countries, China's, in China, the uh, nickname Amer the, China, the average Chinese on the street refers to America as the beautiful country. And indeed we are. Even our deserts are beautiful. But what have we done? We have defiled his land and inheritance. How they defile it, the same way we have. They defiled it by, we're told, they made the, the streets of Jerusalem run red with the blood of innocence. They killed innocent babies as part of their system of of taking drugs, hallucinogenics, drinking alcohol, and, ha and having sex orgies, or people often call it today in America, partying. That's um, and the result of unwanted pregnancies, and their and their results was and their their solution was kill the babies, and that defiled the land. And their heritage is an abomination, and the heritage is not the land but the people. And, and how? And what was that abomination? Well, some of the things they did, it included homosexuality, gay marriage, those kind of things. And even among those who said they were worshiping the Lord. And how this come apart? Those who handle the word of the law, the word of God, did not know him. Because you do not know him from knowing the word of God. You know him from putting the word of God into practice. The pastors transgressed against him. The shepherds transgressed against the, against the Lord. Meaning in transgression is what? All that sin transgressed. Sin is transgressed the law. He that sins also transgressed the law, for sin has transgressed the law. They did not, they did not obey the law. If the pastors were not obeying it, is it any wonder the congregations were not obeying it? And notice false prophets who prophesied by Baal. And we'll talk about how they prophesied in a little bit more. And walk after things that did not profit. What profits is putting the word of God in action. These other things are contrary. To do not profit. They bring harm and destruction. And therefore, hard times are coming, not just to them, but all the way to their grandchildren. And what's causing these, why did they begin? Because all these actions, these pastors has caused them to do what? To do something that has not even been done in pagan countries that worshiped idols. These gods are not yet gods. We're talking about idols. Like the Greco Romans had their, their, their pantheon of gods, there's not the gods in the Norse, in the, the Nor the Norse Druids, um, Celts, and the Germans had their own set. And the, 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 the Romans never traded their set for the German set 
than the German Norse um, Celtic set and vice versa. And so on and so forth. The Chinese didn't trade in their job, their guys for Hindu God for for gods of India and or, or of Africa and so on and so forth. Even idol worshippers would stay true to their idols, you know, they're totally misled. But not these people. They changed their glory. The one they should have been gloried in, the God that was like no other God because he was the only living God in all the universe. To follow after something that was worthless. And today it's it's no different. People may say they follow God, but they do not what he says. And they've created a God of their own imagination. They may not have built a physical idol, but but the but a guy wrote a book very aptly called Nicer Than God. And he talks about how people imagine a God, that God is not the, the God they imagine is not the God of the Bible. Because because what God does sometimes, by human estimations, not very nice at times. He will cast sinners into hell forever. He will bring judgment on the wicked. So in our, in, in often, oftentimes people case, people who go to go to church, who, who, who or even among the among what people would call the religious, they're not. They've changed the glory of the God of the Bible for a God of their own imagination. And how they get there, the pastors transgressed against him. If a pastor's out, if a pastor's caught in fornication like these were, and some they are today, he's not going to be heavy on preaching about fornication. He's not going to tell people do not be deceived. For the, those who fornicate will not inherit the kingdom of God, which is what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-10 through 10 says. Because he himself is transgressing. Instead, he's going to tell them, it doesn't matter what you do. Once saved, always saved. God will not judge you. Those secret things, God's not going to judge you. Pay no attention, pay no attention to what Solomon said. Now, we're going to continue on in Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 6 through 10 talking about the results of the bad pastors. And we'll get in a little more detail of how the bad pastors operate as we go in a few minutes. For even for even your brethren, the house of your God, your father, the house of your father, even they have dealt treacherously with you. They have called they have called a multitude after you. Believe them not, though they speak fair words unto you. I have forsaken my house. I have left my heritage. I have given the deadly, the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. My heritage is me a lion in the forest. It cries out against me. Therefore, I have hated it. My heritage is to me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come, you assembled, all the beasts of the field, come to devour. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trod my portion their feet. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Okay, now this is Yakun Yeremiah talking about how they dealt treacherously. The 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 the, 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 the he's talking to is the people, the people, the congregation of Israel in, in, in Judah, particularly the kingdom of Judah, and how that they how how that how they've been dealt with treacherously. How they've called these big meetings. They all have big, they had they, multitudes were conferences, camp meetings, etc. But they've not told them the truth of these meetings. They spoke fair words in them, words they wanted to hear, words that were easy to swallow, words that were appealing to them, that that brought them comfort, but it was a false comfort. Everything's going to be all right when indeed it wasn't. God, singing God is with us, except. But what was the reality, the truth? God was not with them. He forsook, he forsook his house, the place of assembly. They're there, but he's not. He's left his heritage. The congregation's congregated, but he is not there with them. And in fact, 
He's handing them over to destruction. Why? Because they, the heritage, have cried against him. They do not, they're not only just disobeying him, they're, they are actually saying what he says is right is evil. For a, 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 an example today in the day's world is this whole issue of homosexuality. God says it's an abomination. Yet, yet you have congregations, you, you have conferences, you have, you have whole denominations who basically say those who say that homosexuality is an abomination are haters. Those are words of hate. Those because they're only words of hate to those who are rebelling against God. Those who cry out, who are they really crying out against? We tell them what God's word says. They're crying out against God. And therefore, he's not showing up at their conferences. Yes, they call it they call themselves by his name. Yes, they, yes, they, 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 have, they have powerful speakers who speak eloquently and passionately and perhaps great, perhaps great praise and worship music. But God's not there with them because they are not with him. And who's responsible for this? The pastors, many pastors destroyed his vineyard. They're the ones who have caused God to leave the, to leave the house of God and to leave the congregation of God who, 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 is, who, who, started, who is crying out against him and his ways, who do not want to hear that they, have to, that they have to turn away from this lifestyle of wickedness, this lifestyle of not just homosexuality, fornication, sex outside of marriage, this lifestyle of, of divorcing unjustly according to the word of God, not in line with God's word, and remarrying, which Jesus said is for, it calls adultery. This lifestyle, this lifestyle of abortion. Yes, there's people in congregations who have abortion, and there's congregations who tell him, who tell people, well, we should, we, 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 you know, abortion was painful for the woman and stuff. Well, it is because Satan's a liar. And we should, you know, we should, we should be sympathizing and lifting up. No, we should be telling them not to do it in the first place. We should be telling them not to fornicate and to begin with. We should be guiding them in the right way. That is the job of a pastor to protect his flock. But a pastor does not protect his flock. Remember, the heart of man we saw. No fall no more. The, the, imag the evil imagination of their heart. They will, um, they, will, um, they will do the wrong thing left to themselves like sheep. So those who do not protect the sheep from, from going down the wrong way are no different than those who destroy the sheep. Who destroy the vineyard. Now in Jeremiah 22, 21 through 22, we're, again, we're going to look, look at, these, at these bad pastors and the effect they've had. I spoken to you in your prosperity, but you said, "I will not hear." This has been the matter. This has been your matter from your youth, that you obeyed not my voice. The wind shall eat up your pastors, and your lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then you shall be ashamed and confounded for all your wickedness. Again, notice when he, when, when, when they when do they start refusing to hear when they were prospering. When they had health and wealth, that God gave them, God is the one that gave them prosperity. But the hope, but the but remember, remember the remember, the word of God says, "I'll give you, uh, I'll give you the power to gain wealth, that my covenant may be established in the earth." The wealth is not an end of its me as a means of itself; it's so you can carry out His business. He puts wealth in your hands so you can give it to help take care of the poor, so you can help so you can support missionaries to spread the gospel, so you can do things like that. But, 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 there, but these, these people's heart was on the wealth. And they're like, hey, he's done gave me the wealth. I don't need to do what he says anymore. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that I have to, that I have to, that I have to, that I have to, 
quit drinking alcohol. I don't want to hear that. I'm, that I'm not some victim who's helpless and, and, and cannot and cannot prevent myself. I don't want to hear that your spirit. You'll put your spirit in me if I let you, and I will overcome this instantly. Through, not through my own works, not through my willpower, but through your spirit. I don't want to hear that I have to be different than, the, than, than everyone else. Because he calls us to be a peculiar people. Peculiar means strange, different. We stand out. We aren't like the crowd. And they don't want to hear it. They want to be popular with people. And how long has this been going on? Since their youth. Why have they not been doing? Obeying his voice. And who's the, and, and, and who's the judgment primarily going to come upon for that? Foremost, the wind, that wind refers to in, in, in this context, is Babylon is, 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 is compared, the Babylonians are compared to a sweeping wind, a destructive like tornado that's going to, that's just going to destroy everything. And that wind is going to destroy their pastors. Why? Because their pastors have, are the ones that taught them to not, who catered, they're not willing, being willing to hear, and it, it, it kept it, it not told, admonished them continually to obey his voice. Again, if the shepherd is not protecting the flock, he's harming it. If he's not feeding them the word of God, if he's feeding them anything else, he's not. He's feeding them poison. And we're not. To, uh, uh, we'll discuss this in a little more details because now we're going to get into. How the bad, pa how pastors gone bad operate in some more detail. And we're going to start here in Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 20 through 23. My tabernacle is spoiled and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore to set up my curtains. For pastor, the pastors have become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the brute is come. A great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate, a den of dragons. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man, it is not in man that walks to direct his steps. And first of all, dragons don't be hung up on that. It doesn't mean you know fire-breathing mythical creatures. The Hebrew word can mean lizards. That's what it refers. And if you go to somewhere it's desolate, like we got some place in Oklahoma, uh, some state parks and whatever, where they've never developed, you'll find in the summer you'll see the lizards crawling everywhere. You know, and um, and they're just everywhere. Well, we're not to, we're not to, we're not to look. We're, so that's what it's talking about. But inside cities, the more the more densely populated they are, the more civilized they are, if you will. The more you know. The more developed, the less lizards you find. You might find some in the park or whatever, once in a while somewhere else, but you don't see them crawling everywhere like you do in desolate areas. And that's what's going to happen because of that great that commotion against the Babylonians. Now, notice how the Babylonians are referred to as a brute, okay, as a dumb animal without any understanding. Well, and that's very important. We'll get back to them in a minute. But notice the notice what's happened here. What the tabernacle, the cords, the place where people come to congregate to meet the Lord has, has, has fallen into disrepair. It's, fall, it, it's falling apart. It's rotting it, it, it. You know, it's kind of, and it's totally, and why? It's desolate because the children are gone forth. They're not meeting with him there. No one is taking care of the, of the place to meet with him. And why? Because the pastors are brutish. Uh, they, they, they like the Babylonians to become dumb animals who understand nothing. Remember, they feed the people knowledge and understanding, but they cannot feed what they do not have. They cannot give understanding when they do not have any understanding. Why do they not have no understanding? They have not sought the Lord. They were transgressing against the Lord. And what's the end result? They're not going to prosper. They're not going to prosper because they make their money of, of tithes and offerings. That's how they make their living. They prosper as their congregation prospers. Why have their congregation? Their congregation has been scattered. And we see that in England, there's church buildings that stood there for hundreds of years 
I was reading about this that that, that no one has attended Sundays now for decades. And the question is who do they belong to because they didn't belong to an individual before. And they, you know, and, and they're trying to figure out what to do with them. And people, and in some cases, the government's taking them in the domain. And you can buy, you can literally buy your own church building. Well, in America, we have the same situation. We have, we, we have church buildings. And again, they don't belong to any individual. They, in America, we built, we, when we were building up, when we were building our towns, our cities, we follow a biblical model, which I explained with the pilgrims before, of congregationalism. Where we built the first thing people built was a church, and then they built a community around the church. But the church didn't, you know, and perhaps the church may actually be outside the out on the outer edge of town or something. But still, it was the center of the community. Sometimes, literally, uh, and if not literally, figuratively. And in this place, like I grew up, as, um, half our farm was was in a place called Mountain View, a township. And the township had a building. It was a church. But in prior years, that church was also the school building. And on Saturday nights, they met. They met to conduct the township business. And if, and if, a, if, a, if, a, if a sheriff, if a sheriff or someone came along, or someone had, they met at the church for everyone. There was no ideal a separation of church and state that people have made up in this day and age that is not in the Constitution. It was all the same building, the school, the church. The govern the the place where the government met was the same building. It just got repurposed during different time different times of the of, of of the week. And this was the center of it. But now the thing's abandoned. No one has met there in years. And why? How did it become abandoned? Is it because where I grew up became less populous? No, it actually has more people living out there, much more than when I grew than when I grew up. Many people have bought out there, bought small tracts of land, set of trailers, and built houses and stuff. The population densities actually went up because no one is, is showing up to it. No one is going there attending. And what caused it? The pastors at the caused it at the beginning. They caused the flock to be scattered. And as a result, they quit being paid and they quit being a pastor at all. And why does this happen? Because man is not smart to take care of himself. The man that walks cannot direct his own steps. The way a man should go is not in himself. There's a way that seems right to man, but only leads to death. Man was never meant never meant to be self-sufficient. He was meant to be he was never meant to be independent of God, but dependent upon God. And the sheep, when the pastor does not direct him, does not protect him, does not feed them, eat poison, and are subject to be, the, 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 be, being preyed upon by predators and being scattered. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 4, we see some more about how these about pastors gone bad and how they operate. Woe to the pastors that destroy and scatter sheep in my pasture, says the Lord. Thus, there, thus, therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my sheep. You have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your of your doings, says the Lord. And I will gather out the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them, and will bring them again to their foes, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I'll set shepherds over them that shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Okay, in context here, explain the context first, and then we'll look at the application to us, to us today. Again, he's talking to the people of the kingdom of Judah, and the people are scattered, are the, are, are, the, are, are the people of Israel, the people of Judah. There was three scatterings. The northern kingdom was, was, was the Assyrians came, took them away, and scattered them. And some went to the, many went to the, 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 the cities of the Persians and the Medes were towed. So when the people of Judah were scattered, they also met them there. But many of them were not and, and, and have never returned. The people who were scattered in the Babylonian from the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom after the kingdom split the two, 
they were they were carried away by the Babylonians, scattered, and again many never returned, like in the Book of Esther. The minor, a very small remnant returned. Then, in the days of Yeshua, Moses, the man, remember what God said: "I'll raise a prophet like unto you, like unto Moses, whom you must obey. If you do not obey, I'll require it of you." How they treat that prophet? Not everyone, but the leadership of the country. Badly. And again, the other, even there, there was some disconsent. Remember, Nicodemus and, Arima, and Joseph Arimathea were on the council as well and consented not. And remember, and remember, Gam Gam Gamaliel said, leave him alone. If this is not of God, it'll fall apart. If it is of God, we don't be fighting against God. But the majority, the majority, and they didn't need everyone. They only need a quorum. And at night, they, 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 they did, they did this at night illegally and probably just didn't invite people and thought was, that might that might that might vote against it. So all this result was the rejected Messiah. And he said, and, and, and among those punishments would be scattering. And today the Roman diaspora, the Roman scattering, diaspora just means Greek word for scattering, has continued to this day. The scattering of the first two was primarily to the east and somewhat to the south in Egypt, maybe a little north towards Turkey, but the one, but the Roman ones primarily to the west. And to this day, we have this, we have this, we have the results of that scattering, even to the far ends of the earth. Even the Rapa Nui, an island in the South Pacific, that's literally the first place on the earth you can get away, you can get from Jerusalem. I personally knew a Jewish man who was from there who lived on the who lived on the south who lived on the, on the southwest peninsula. His house was literally the furthest place on earth you could be and have that was an inhabited place on earth from Jerusalem. And what caused this? The pastors that fed his people. Yes, they fed the flock, but they didn't feed them the word of God. They fed they fed them messages they wanted to hear. They fed them. They fed. They they, they pilled their flesh. It, they did not rebuke them when they did wrong. Did not take that rod to correct them. The shepherd's rod. That rod being the word of God, and sometimes it it, it, it can smite. A, it can it can smart a mite to hit, be hit with a rod. The rod of correction could be a little painful. But it's done to keep you from to keep you out of more out of more serious pain. But they did not use that rod. They did not they did not use that staff to pull the sheep back in. And remember, the sheep's natural inclination is to wander off. Their natural inclination is, it, and then then predators come along and they, they they flee even more and they end up all scattered out. That's a, that's the natural inclination of sheep. And what happened when they and they and they, so but the but the pastors drove them away, the ones who did speak up and did what was right, they drove them away, and they did not visit them when they were in trouble. They did not go to rescue them. But good news, he's going to bring a pastor. He's going to set up shepherds. Remember, he said this. We looked at this for there. He's going to bring up shepherds that are going to feed them. Feed them what knowledge and understanding. And what's the result of that? He's going to bring them again into their foads. I want you to notice the foads are multiple, multiple congregations. But there's even a deeper meaning than that, which we're going to look at in a few minutes. And they're going to be fruitful and increase. He's going to put pastors that's going to feed them the word of God, that feed them knowledge and understanding. And the result of that is going to be they're going to not be feared nor dismayed nor are they lacking. But this is true of not just about the people of Israel, the people of Judah, about all of us, the hope he's the Lord, the shepherd. He's, he's not just God, of the Jews, but God, of the Gentiles as well. He's the, he's the maker of the whole human race, not just the Jewish people. And we'll look and we'll talk about that in some more detail in a moment here. But the reason why. The reason why. Our sheep are being scattered. We got we got this thing going on in the U.S. right now. We're after COVID. I forgot. I've I forgot. I've forgotten the term that we actually got a term for this. But after COVID, 
after COVID, pe- during COVID, people people were, were, were couldn't congregate together. And after it, they quit coming back. They, a lot of people quit coming back to, to congregate. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Some mostly bad, a few good. And part of it, and, and most of it, it, in fact, a lot of those who quit, now they quit congregating. Now they left the, not, now they've not returned to the church they were going to before the congregation. They quit following God altogether. They've actually became atheists and things like that. Now, some, it's for a different reason, and they've taken a different direction altogether. They didn't return to their congregation because during COVID, they started doing their own Bible studies and started reading the Word of God themselves and realized they had not been being fed the Word of God, the pure Word of God. And they haven't found somewhere to congregate out with people who's really going to teach them, who's going to, who's going to, who's going to feed them the, the true Word of God. And perhaps they're being fed over the internet or whatever instead. Because they don't find, they can't find one locally who's doing it. But the majority of them, that's not the case. So, and the cause, and the cause of all this, the, so the pastors have been scattered by these hard times, and the hard times came as a result. This this COVID, make no mistake, was is judgment from God. Make no mistake about it. It's what plagues are one of his forms of judgment. He talks about over and over again. When it's of long endurance, the Bible tells it's a judgment from him. And how did we get this judgment from us? Because our pastors did not feed them. But good news, he's going to set pastors who do feed them. That's the promise. And of course, not just pastors that feed Israel, but pastors that feed the whole world. So there's a little bit of good news there about in the midst of all the bad news about the bad pastors, about pastors gone bad. Now we're going to look here, continue on in Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 7, looking at pastors gone bad and how they operate, as well as the effect they've had on people. In those days, in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces there towards there, saying, Come and join us, join ourselves to the Lord in the perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. All that found them have devoured them. Their adversary said, We have been not because they have sinned against the Lord the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. So notice they're going to come back in repentance. They're going to go back to Zion. Zion remembers the place where Messiah rules from. They're going to come back there and they're going to join themselves. That will not be forgotten. Well, will it not be forgotten because of those good pastors we just talked about. They're going to be set up. Who are going to teach, who are going to feed them with knowledge and understanding. Not feed them with things that they want to hear with itching ears. But what caused them to apostatize in the first place? Why do they become lost? Because of pastors causing them to go astray. Remember, the reason for pastors in the first place was so they would not be sheep without a shepherd. The sheep must have a shepherd. They cannot take care of themselves. And they turned them away on the mountains, the valleys down low, or where the grass is growing, perhaps gentle hills between them. But they went from mountains and they went to hills where they perhaps saw some grass, but they were not safe places. There were, dev- there, were, there were enemies there who devoured them. And those their devourers, they, they justify themselves and they've sinned against the Lord, which is true. The habitation of justice. Where the Lord is, where, his, where people do what he says, is the habitation of justice. Now, it really is racist to go around Black Lives Matter because all lives matter. 
But I understand the sentiment to some degree. What they're saying is that lot some cases, some people are, are just whiners. Make no bones about it. But what some are saying is they, they that would not be that this is, America is not a place of justice. It's not a place of racial justice, and I talked about that because racial justice, like all justice, comes from the Lord, and it's not it's become a, it's not a place of racial justice. It's causing all this all this disruption uh, uh, along ethnic lines and, and so-called racial lines because we've not because people have not treated each other justly. And I'm going to say it area out loud. I'm going to say what a lot of these people will, will not say. It is a two-way street. I learned that young when I was, I was in the Air Force and went to Mississippi. I went to congregations where I was the only, where I was the only person. I was, the only, I was the only person with my that had skin as light as mine by a long shot of a European, of a primarily European ancestry. And the attitude was like, what are you doing here, white boy? I learned is a two-way street a long time ago. Because the human heart has evil imaginations we've seen. Yes, some white, some some so-called white people made did some did, did wrong to them. And perhaps even in I was in Miss I was in Black City and they were definitely being oppressed by by Again, so-called white people who are really some shade of brown, but people, a few of European ancestry, but not every European ancestry. It's assumed that because I had European ancestry, I was an oppressor of them. Is called prejudice. They judged me before knowing me. They prejudged me. Racial justice and all justice comes from seeking the Lord. And, be, and seeking the Lord, and it comes from pastors who pre who feed people knowledge and under knowledge of the Word of God and understanding of the Word of God, how to apply it. And without it, we'll never our country. Our country at times has been has not always been a habitation of of, of justice, even though even though we say liberty and justice for all it, in our pledge of allegiance, it never will be. Until it, until we return to following God, to we to our and that's never going to happen. So our pastors feed people knowledge of the Word of God and understanding of how to apply it. Now we're going to wrap up by we're going to wrap up looking at the bad pastors examination and and, and what God's going to do it what. What, and, and, and what God's going to do about it? He's not going to allow this situation to continue on forever. He didn't. He didn't allow it in Israel. He's not allowing it in the future. He's fixing it. And he's not going to allow it to continue forever in any country, including America. And what? What? So what happened in, in Israel? Ezekiel thirty-four verses one through four is where we start. And the word of the Lord came to me saying. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves and do not, and should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with a wool, you kill them, they're fed, but you feed not the flock. The diseased you have not strengthened, neither have you healed them which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought, brought again that which was driven away. If you sought that which was lost, but with force and cruelty have you ruled them. Okay, here's what's driving bad shepherds to go bad. They feed the they, they feed themselves, but not the flock, not the congregation. Now, this part here about eating the fat and yes, the flock is to feed them. That we're, we're told we're told concerning tithes and offerings by Shaul, the Apostle Paul, is not what shepherd does not drink of the milk of the flock. You know, comes over the wool of the flock. But the problem is they're not they're only feeding themselves. They're not taking care of the flock at all. Not only not feeding it, those are the Z's, they're not strengthening them. 
They're not bringing them up and putting them aside to be healed and taking special care of them. They're not healing that which is sick. They, if one breaks his leg or something, they're not, they're not binding his leg up to get, you know, putting a little cast on it or whatever and taking care of it to, to heal its wound, to heal its leg. If one gets driven away, they're not they're, they're not bringing it back again to the flock. It, they're not if one's lost, they're not seeking after it. But they're ruling as dictators in their congregations over the congregation of Israel. Now, this is not so undifferent today. We have pastors who are totally only oh, as we as people say in America, they're looking out for number one. They do not care about their flock. It's all about them, what their flock can do for them. I saw on the I saw where a guy or a pastor was throwing a fit because his congregation would not buy him an expensive watch. He was not concerned about the about the flock at all. And if someone left his congregation, he did not go seek them out to try to bring them back in. They, some in America, we got some things. Some things we will do, or you say we, they, we'd say that, and that's sick and wrong, or sick and twisted. So, you know, or or, the, or or their mind's not right. You know, they got they got mental disease or whatever the case may be. The people who are in those conditions, they aren't strengthening them. They're not trying to help the addict overcome his addiction. They're they're not interested in anyone. They want they only want people who are prospering in their congregation, who will not argue with them, who will not, who who will who will just simply come there, have a good time, give them tithes and offerings, and move on. And anyone that dares go against them, they'll have, who brings up to them the word of God and says, "Hey, that's not right." They will they, they they will try to make an example of them. They will try to lord it because they're trying to lord it over the flock. And, and and when you live in a world when you live in a, an age where apostasy is rampant, we have bad pastors. There's a high chance if you if you are actually going to do what God's word says, you are going to be kicked out of a congregation. I have been kicked out of three. That helps start one of them. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 5 through 8, we're going to continue on about God's view of these pastors and how things are going to, and his anger at them. And they were scared because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scared. My sheep wandered to the mountains and upon every hill I hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon the earth, and none did search them or seek after them. Wherefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord, surely because my flock became a prey and my sheep became meats every bird to the field, because there was no shepherd, near did my, ser my shepherd search for the my flock, for the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Okay. Remember, the whole purpose of the pastor was to keep the, the, the shepherd, the sheep cannot, the sheep cannot be, not let them be a sheep without a shepherd. Because the, the sheep will become scared. And now, interesting, the word Hitler means wolf. A beast of the field that devours sheep. And we talked a moment ago about, about these, about the, about these sheep and how, and how these people who, who, who devour them justify themselves. And the Nazis did this. And in fact, throughout Europe, it, it is true that the majority of Jewish people rejected Messiah, but did not give Europeans a license to persecute them. And yet they would set up these passion plays about the tell about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for the purpose of inciting hatred against Jews. Not to bring people to the gospel, not to bring the but to, but but the cast but the, but the cast the Jews as responsible for the death of Messiah. 
And there is no justification because we'd re we'd read on in there. We find that God judges those who have that attitude. But what caused them in the first place to get in this position? How did they get scared in the first place? They're shepherds, which were the rabbis. They're the ones who primarily rejected the, the, the teachings of Yeshua, who rejected Messiah. Why? Because he said it had nothing to do with their teachings. Their, his doctrine was not their doctrine. Post Sermon on the Mount, most of it is him saying, God, he said, he makes very plain, he didn't come away to take away the law. But to show us how to, how to keep it the way God and the Father always intended. And he contrasts how he says to keep it versus how they say. That's most of the Sermon on the Mount. Most of chap the last part of chapter 5 and virtually all of chapter 6 and 7 is just contrast between how to keep God's law the way they're telling you and the way he's telling you. The way the Father intended. And what was the result? They were scattered. And then none did search after them. And notice, this none searched after them. Rabbi, the rabbis opposed the return of, of evil to Israel. And now, in practice, they would, they, they would say, in, in with their mouths, they'd say, oh, yeah. But when someone that enriched their congregation, who was a big contributor, want, would say, I, feel, you know, I think I should go back to the Holy Land and blah, blah, blah. Then they were suddenly against it. Because, while well, they were contributing a lot of money to their congregation, <laughs> to their own salary, except. And they didn't, and, and the ones, and, and that was their scare. They did not seek after him. Now today, there's a group in Israel who seeks after, who seeks after the Jews, Jewish people to bring them to Israel. But it was not the case until recent times. And who did seek after and search him? Christian Zionists, Gentiles. Yes, there were Christian Zionists. There were Gentiles. Who, who tried to make, who, who, who sought to bring about the country of Israel it back into existence 200 years before they were Jewish. By Jewish, I mean non Jewish believers, Zionists. And honest students of history, like the father, Benjamin Netanyahu, former prime minister of Israel, will tell you Benjamin Netanyahu said this more than once there would be no Israel but one for Christian Zionists. Who should have been seeking them to bring them back to the land of Israel? The rabbis who appoint themselves, the shepherds of the Jewish people themselves. But they, but why did they do that? Because they did not, they fed themselves. But today it's no different. Again, as I mentioned, among, among Gentile believers, among, among people in America, if a if if a if a member of their congregation is not a a large financial contributor who's helping that pastor feed himself, and he, and he, and he, and he doesn't show up, say for a week, um, no big deal. But doesn't show up, let's say for a month, two months, three months go by. Nobody, the pastor does not go after him. the pastor does not send anyone else after him. If he's got a large congregation, he can't go personally. He doesn't search for the flock because he's only interested in feeding himself. He only cares about the about the ones who wander off who are taking a who are taking contributions with them that he wants. That was a condition in the days of Ezekiel. It's a condition today, not just in America, but large large parts of the world at large. Remember the final phase of in the area. Of any area, we we look to the angel, the angel, the angel of the church. The final phase is Laodicea, where where they're ri where I'm rich, I'm prosperous, I don't need nothing, mean not include including the Lord, and they're really blind, and poor, and naked, and miserable. That's where America's reached. That's where the world's headed. Just other people have not part of the part of the world isn't caught up yet, but they but they're going to. They will get there soon. Now, in Ezekiel 39 through 30, 34, 9 through 12, we continue on with this condition and what the Lord's going to do about it. He's going to do something about this. He's not going to leave things in this condition forever. Wherefore, O you shepherds, the bad shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord, I am against the shepherds. I require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding my flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore. For I'll deliver my flock from their mouth. They may not be meat for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that is scattered, so I will seek my sheep and deliver them out of the place where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Now I'm going to start at the beginning, at the end here for a moment. The cloudy and dark day, it, I talked about this extensively last, last, last year when I talked about when I talked about the setting up the kingdom, the day when Messiah reigns and he comes. The day, the day, the day of Armageddon that ends the reign of the Antichrist, that dark and cloudy day when Messiah returns is what it's referencing. And that's when all of Israel is going to be scattered. Remember, the regathering of Israel does not end until after Messiah is on the earth. And remember, in Ezekiel 40, we're told he does not gather them all to Israel. He gathers them to the wilderness where he destroys every rebel among them that will not obey him. And it's implied nine out of ten who go into the wilderness are not coming back out of it. This is the greater exodus the Bible talks about. It's not for believers. It's for those who have been rebellious against the Messiah. And, he, and, the, and, it's, the, and it's the weed out. It's the weed out and it's, the, it's the save who he can among them. And get rid of the rest so all these promises of these good things can come upon the remnant who will accept him. So, so what's the end of these pastors? He's going to destroy them. And they're no longer, he's no longer, there's no longer going to be any bad pastors. They're going to be destroyed. The, now, now, Ezekiel's written, the, the Babylonians have already drug him off. He's in exile, Ezekiel is. They've returned at the time of Ezekiel, but he's not there. Remember, he, remember he, he, he's near the river Kabar. He, he, he's way over in, uh, I, I guess, what's today, uh, uh, Iraq. He's 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 a, he's a few he's a couple thousand miles or so away, or maybe it's a thousand. But anyway, it's far enough. He's he, he's away, and not near them. And the Lord has shown him things that's going on over there. So even after they returned, they went back to that system, and and God Himself says enough. It's not going to go on forever. I will search out my seek and sheep and find him. He's going to bring back the, the, the people of Israel. But it's the same for us. Those who really are wanting to follow him, those who call themselves by his name, it's not hopeless. He is going to seek us out. He is going to seek us out. Now, he's going to seek us out. And when's this going to When's this? How's it going to, when's it ultimately going to happen when Messiah returns to the earth, not to meet in the clouds, with the worthy, not to meet, not the not those who rise from the dead to meet with and meet with him in the air, but when he comes back with the, the saints to deliver Israel, when the, Israel says to him, "Hashem Adonai, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord." So the promise is, a good shepherd is coming. Now. We're going to look in Zechariah chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, and look at the setup for that good shepherd. The condition of when, of when he comes. Ask the Lord in rain, ask the Lord rain a time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall bring bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. So the idols have spoken vanity. The diviners have, have seen a lie. They have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. My anger was kindled against the shepherds. I punished the goats. And I punished the goats. The Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and made them as his godly horse in battle. Again, another prophetic time referring to the time when Messiah returns to this earth. Now, this rain, this latter rain, 
it, well, one thing it's talking about literal rain on the land of Israel when it comes in the due season, so that so that everything does green up and grow grass and, and grow and become all green today, like like it is in some parts of Israel, but not all. But even the desert, we're told, is going to bloom. But there's another side to that: the rain of the Holy Spirit, the early and latter rain, the rain of holy, of like in Pentecost. The upon the Jewish people, but also, also is, is people in general. And we'll and we'll look at that in detail and show that this is absolutely true. But what was the condition? What's the condition? Why is he? Because there because there is no shepherd. The whole point of the pastors is so that there would not be a condition with the sheep without a shepherd. The sheep, the sheep that went their own way as a flock that were troubled. They got they got in all kinds of trouble because sheep are dumb and can't take care of themselves and get themselves in trouble. <laughs> well, some of them some of them have a, have a natural. Um, they want to be like everybody else, and, and if one will if one will fall off a cliff, a whole bunch of them will fall off will follow it and fall off with them. They're just totally senseless. And how they become and, and what what do these shepherds do instead? He's so angry about why that these they, they have idols. Now these idols, I'm going to say again, in our day are not necessary. There are idols. People rename a statue Jesus or Mary and say it's, and say they're not worshiping an idol. Yes, they are. In the Word of God, it's told, we're told the reason why God did not appear to Israel, He did not let them see a shape or similitude, was so they would not make an idol of Him. He did not want them worshiping an image of him. How much more true for the son, for his son and, it, and and his mother? It is idolatry. We are in a land full of idols. Yes, we got idols from the Hindus, and now we got Ma, we got um. I was in Atlanta, and there's a large Hindu. There's a large Hindu building down there when I was there. Temple, full of these idols. And these idols cannot help you. They speak nothing. But the idols it's talking about here are, are how, idols in the house of God. In their case, they were literal idols. But in our case, they're often not. We've made another Jesus. People have preached another gospel, like the Book of Mormon being an example. And their gospel is another Jesus. But it's not just related, restricted to Mormons and the like. A Jesus that's not a Jesus that stands for justice, and and and, he will, and he's going to judge the wicked. He's going to and he's going to judge every man and give every man according to his works, as we saw Solomon said. But this is a false Jesus, a a, a Jesus that people have made in their own image, a Jesus that is that, that that people comfort each other with that these that these that these bad shepherds have comforted people with in vain. And they and they'll say they had dreams, and they'll say, and sometimes they'll say they dream. They have these dreams of, of of peace and prosperity, and whatever coming, and it doesn't come to pass. They're not from God. They are lies, because we will not have peace and prosperity from God. We are rebellion against God, just like Israel didn't. And God is angry against these people for this, because the sheep are scattered. And this is the case of Israel. Zechariah is one of the latest, one of the last, one of the last among the, light, the latest of the prophets, and, and he's angry at them. And he's going to punish the goats. The goats are among the sheep, but they're not part of the sheep. They resist the sheep. The sheep will follow the shepherd. The goats resist the shepherd, the good shepherd. They resist the word of God. They're in the congregation of God, but they're against the word. Just like I talked about. In the greater Exodus, the sheep among Israel are going to be just, are going to be brought into the land of Israel, and the goats among them are going to be destroyed in the wilderness. And it's going to be the same. And it's the same because a good shepherd, a good shepherd, is is the remedy to solve this problem of the sheep without, without the sheep without being, the people being, the congregation being like sheep without a shepherd. And we see how this. We see how it starts being solved through Yeshua, the Messiah, 
here in Matthew chapter 9, verses 34 through 36. But the Pharisee said, He cast out devils to the prince of devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their congregations and their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, hearing every good healing every sickness and every disease among the people. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Okay, first of all, I want you to notice the Pharisees. When they're accusing Yeshua of casting out devils to the prince of devils, they are rejecting the good shepherd, the shepherd Messiah sent. And, and, and they are in charge. Remember, the, the Pharisees are in charge of the synagogues. The Sadducees at the time were in charge of the, of the temple. And so, we're, so where's Messiah going? He's going to the synagogues. He's going to the congregations. And he's teaching, teaching them knowledge and understanding. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's telling them the good news of the kingdom, the, of, the, of that good shepherd that he is, who is going who's go, who's to feed them knowledge and understanding. He's healing the sick and the, every disease among them. He's not leaving the sheep sick and diseased. But a good shepherd takes care of them. And now I want you to notice this. When he, when, afterwards, when he sees the multitudes, and he's, they're fainting. They're scattered abroad as sheep that have no shepherd. And this is not because they're hungry they're fainting at this point. They're hungry, but not faint, not hungry for physical food, but hunger for the pure word of God. They've been being fed, but they've been being fed lies. They've been being fed vanity. They've been being fed the things of the world. As I discussed when I talked about the music ministry, how, how we are not to have secular songs because the world and all that in it is not of the father we cannot love the world and love the father all that's in every secular song is either about the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes or the pride of life and they are not of the father and we're not to mix them and and, and this is what is part of what's gone on in particular uh, particularly the sadducees particularly mixed in all kinds of greek philosophy and stuff but, but they're they're faint. They cannot they, they're lightheaded. They cannot think straight. They cannot see clearly, because they've not been given the word of God. And they're they're the condition is they're scattered abroad as sheep with no shepherd. The very thing that pastors were given, the the fathers raised up Joshua as a pastor to prevent from happening. Now we continue on looking at the good shepherd, our ultimate example of a pastor. Messiah, Yeshua, here in Mark, chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. And he said to them, Come yourselves apart in a desert place and rest a while. For there are many coming and going, and they, have no, and they had no leisure so much to eat. He departed a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw him departing, and knew, and many knew him, and ran a foot out of many cities, there out of all cities, and outwent them and came together unto him. And when Jesus came, he saw them as people were moved with compassion on them. Because they were not, they were a sheep not having a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. Okay. Notice this. The shepherd is tired. So are those, is, is helpers. They've been so busy taking care of the sheep, they haven't even had time to sit down for a proper meal. They could not even eat together. The best they could have perhaps done was grab something and, and put it in their mouth while they walked from one place to another. Or perhaps they couldn't even do that. So they're on this ship and they're trying to get some rest. They're needing to go to a place away from the crowd so they can be re regenerated and recharged. But when the sheep, the people saw them, they went there. The sheep will do that. They'll go where they see the shepherd. Once they get used to a shepherd's voice, the, even if they smell a shepherd, they will go to where the shepherd is. Or if they know he's used to going to a place, they'll go there in anticipation of meeting him. And in this case, they, they, they could see where he was going, so they went there to meet him. And because, he's the good she, because he is a good shepherd, 
He's not one of these shepherds gone bad. He has compassion on them. Because, because, because what's their condition? Sheep without a shepherd. The thing that the Lord, the Father, raised up sheep, shepherds from the pastors or shepherds in the first place to prevent from happening. And what does he do? He teaches them many things. Remember, he feeds, teaching them is feeding them, the, feeding them the knowledge of the word of God and the understanding of the word of God, of how to apply it. Now, he feeds them food later. They were not faint, as we saw earlier, from a lack of food yet. They were not, they were not faint. They were not faint. They were not in need of, food, of physical food yet. But they were in need of what they were hungered for. That's why they're out there running for him. They're hungry. They want to be fed the pure word of God. This is what the ultimate good pastor, good shepherd did. And that's what keeps the sheep from being scattered. This is why the sheep, this is why you must, that's why you cannot, the sheep must have a pastor or they will be scattered. Because they they got that hunger, they're going to go look for it somewhere. Now in Isaiah fifty six, eight through eleven, we're gonna we're gonna stop here for a moment. I'm gonna, we're gonna look at this. I said we'd look at this. Notice most of these things I've talked about have been about Judah directly and in context in Israel. And because of that, in places like Yeshua says, where I can't, we looked at last week, a few weeks back, where he says, "I come not but to, but to the." So the lost sheep, I was not to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to so the Syrophoenician woman. And what, and we talked about how that was, how it was really about him, his mission, not to get off mission. He's not, but the head of the congregation can't just run around from here to there, but has to be, be focused on what he's supposed to be doing, right? But he did take care of the woman nonetheless because of her faith. He found a way to take care of her. She found, you know without getting off his mission. And people have said, well, you know, see, so it's only for Israel. It's only for Jewish people. It's not for them other people. It's not for Gentiles. And by Jewish people, sometimes they mean not people who are culturally Jewish or, or, been, or, or, or became Jews. They, 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 sometimes they, 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 they will distinguish and have prejudice towards people who are, who are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we looked at God himself, himself says in the Torah, he is not a regarder of people. He does not regard people. He is not impressed with your ancestry. He is equal opportunity. I have a, a lesson called that where I show it. Equal opportunity. Those who do what he say, get the blessings he promised. Those who reject his word, get the curse he promised. He's never been, a, but nonetheless, these people are. And the ironic thing is, a lot of them are not physical the sins of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob either. They say they are, but they say they are Jews, but they lie. But they, 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 they are liars, like we discussed last week when I talked about the angel of the church. But what does God say about this issue? What about this issue? Is this really only for Israel? We're going to start by looking at. Is the good shepherd only a good shepherd for the house of Israel? We're going to start by looking at this in Isaiah 56, verses 8 through 11. The Lord God, which gathers the outcast of Israel, says, Yet I will get others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. All ye beasts of the field, come to the bower. Yea, all ye beasts in the, in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are ignorant. They are, they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping and lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs that can never come enough. They can never have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look for their own to their own way. Everyone for his gain from his quarter. Okay, so notice he's starting to the outcast of Israel. And we'll get back to that. But again, notice the shepherds. Notice the pastors, the shepherds. They're, they're like blind watchmen. They cannot see what's coming. They cannot see the trouble on the horizon. Why? Because they're ignorant of the word of God. They don't see what's going on. They just tell me what they want to hear. They don't know. Any, they're worse, they're worse than, the than the congregants. 
They're mute dogs. They cannot warn anyone. They have no voice to warn them. The point of a dog's barking is to warn you someone's coming. They are li literally lying down sleeping on the job. They are greedy because they're in for themselves and greed never has enough. They, they cannot understand. They cannot understand because they because the only way to understand God's word is not just to read it, but to put it into practice and do it. They can understand because they are looking to their own way. They're not looking out for the good of the sheep. They're not looking out. They're looking for a gain. They're from, from his own from his quarter. And they're doing it with the least disruption and trouble to themselves. They want to stay home. When the sheep go, they don't want to go chase after them. But this condition is not just about Israel, I want you to notice. Who is he talking to? The outcast of Israel. Who's going to get the outcast of Israel? But notice he's going to get others to him as well. Remember, foes, multiple foes, not just one flock of sheep, multiple flocks of sheep. And, the, and he's going to gather not just the outcast of Israel, but others as well. And this is why Yeshua, this is why Yeshua, addresses and references here in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 16. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not. Sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. And I'm known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have which are not this fold. Them I must also bring. They shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Okay, so we're going to start at the bottom. One fold, one shepherd. A fold consisting of more than one fold. Remember, the shepherd's under the good shepherd, right? But one shepherd overall. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is come in the person of Yeshua himself to gather. And notice this shepherd. So he's not, so, he, so the pattern is consistent. The Jew first and the Gentile. When he fed the 5,000, he gave it to the 12 disciples. He didn't give the food directly to the people. He gave it to the 12 disciples. He fed the 5,000. Those 12,000, those 12 represented the 12 tribes of Israel. The, the multitudes out there, the 5,000 plus the women and children, represented the Gentiles. His pattern, God gives to the Jewish people. To them, we're given the oracles of God. They give to the Gentiles. Everyone gets fed. The, Paul Shaul said in Romans to the Jew first and the Gentile, he demonstrated his own ministry. Every place he went, he went to the Jews first. He always started at the synagogue if there was one. And even in the synagogue, he went to the he went he, he went to the he went to the Jew he went to the Jews who were either who either were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or had become Jews through circumcision. And then he would talk to the righteous Gentiles, the God fearers. We left out of idolatry, but we're not circumcised. And then finally, they would go to the people who knew nothing, because now he has some help. This is the pattern. He was never sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. He was sent at that time to go to them first. But in the end, he's not ruler of Israel. Yet David, in fact, we're told, will be king over Israel. He is king of the whole world. He's king of Jew and Gentile. He's king of the Jews, yes, but he's also going to be king or lord over the Gentiles. Lord having more of an ideal. We often think of it in the terms of English for the lords under a king, but in the Roman, in the Roman world, the lord, was Caesar was called lord, not king. Lord is the emperor, okay, the king of kings. And he's lord of lords, and okay, there may be kings or over other kings. In the, in the eternal kingdom, but he's the top dog overall. 
And what's his characteristic of a good shepherd? What does he do? That, the contrast between him and the bad shepherds. He gives his life for the sheep. Remember, these are after themselves. He's comparing like hirelings. When the wolf's coming, he flees. He leaves the sheep and flees. And, and in some cases, this was literally true with Hitler. There were, there were rabbis who left their congregation without warning to save them and their own families. And the sheep, their congregation were on their own. And, many, and some were killed and some, and some were, were, were hidden Ironically, mostly by believers who like in the hiding place. Now, not every rabbi, do not get me wrong, but there were definitely rabbis who should have been shepherds who fled when the wolf, Hitler, remember Hitler means wolf, his name, came. Now, that's just one example. But there's wolves coming too. There's wolves who come into the flock, who are false prophets, false teachers. And the and the shepherd and the good shepherd and the good shepherd's job is to, is to fight them off. And in this case, Yeshua fought them off and it cost him his life. The wolves killed him. The wolves being the Sadducees and Pharisees primarily. They caught they they you know they got the Romans involved and they had him crucified. Because he is a good shepherd. He care. He lays. He'll give his life for the sheep, and he did. But the hireling, those who are just in it for what they can get out of it, will never do so. That is the ultimate test of a good shepherd versus a bad shepherd. Will they lay down their lives for the for the sheep? And it, it may not be their physical lives, but the good shepherd, you can see them. They will go out of their way. They will be inconvenienced for the sake of the sheep. They will lay their lives down for them. And Messiah is the ultimate good shepherd. He's our ultimate shepherd, the ultimate example of a pastor. And in 1 Peter 2.24-25, we see the results of, of, a, of a good shepherd in action, of our good shepherd, Jew and Gentile, who himself bore his sins on his own body in the on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live in the righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were all for you are sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Now remember, Peter is writing to Jews, yes, but also Gentiles. I want you to remember that. And this good shepherd, how do how do he lay down his life? Uh, he, he, how do he protect the sheep? Because remember, shepherd's job is to feed and protect. He fed the word of God, then he then he protected them. He fed them the he fed the word of God. He fed them knowledge and understanding, but then he then he laid down his life to protect them on the cross. It was him or us, and there was no way he was going to let it be us. So that we should now be dead to sin. We should no longer be continuing in sin. We should be living under righteousness. Righteous, remember, is doing what's right in the eyes of God. And notice, that shepherd, the good shepherd, remember the characteristic of the good shepherd is they heal the sick. The bad shepherds did not heal, did not heal. He healed us, but how he, he paid for our physical healing. More than those other things I said, beyond just that, our physical healing. And how they do that? He took, stri he took stripes. There's no other reason given for them. He could have died on the cross without being beaten and his skin ripped off of him and everything else with those stripes it's referring to. And we'd still been saved from hell. We'd still got eternal life. But our bodies couldn't have been healed. Just as he that knew no sin became sin, he who deserved no sickness took, who deserved the not, who, who had no desire, had no deserving, had no, 
had not brought in any, or in any shape, manner, form sickness on himself, took sickness on himself, took the pain that comes from sickness, the, the wounds on himself so we could be healed because he is the ultimate good shepherd. And we've all been a sheep going astray. The whole human race is like, it's not, in, it's not just something, a pro, an Israel problem, a Jew problem. It's a human problem. That we, will, that we will go astray without a shepherd. And he's our shepherd. He's the overseer of our souls. And remember, a shepherd's an overseer. He's the ultimate overseer of the flock. He may have others under him, but he's the overseer. He's responsible for our souls. Now we're going to wrap up by looking at pastors today. Good pastors. How good pastors are like the good shepherd. And, 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 and what God really expects of them. Ephesians chapter, we're going to start Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 13. Wherefore, he says, he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now he did ascend, it was even the also ascended first in the lower parts of the earth. He did ascend as the same to ascend up far above the earth and let fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come to the union of faith to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ. Now, when did he ascend? When did he ascend on high? This is after his resurrection, after he returned. And we after he ascended after his resurrection. And we talk, look at this, and we looked at Psalms where David's quoting from 68 in detail, uh, this a little bit in more detail. And he, and he gives these gifts of men for what purpose? To keep them on the path of righteousness. To help unrighteous men do what's right in God's eyes. And what are these, God, what are these gifts he gave? Pa apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and, and teachers. What people often call the five-fold ministry. Because there's five of them. And, what's the, and, and this pastors or shepherds, what's their job? Perfect the saints. Remember, Tilios, perfecting, bring to full maturity. For the work of the ministry, it doesn't have on itself. The ministry is spelled W-O-R-K. And someone has to do that work to build up the body of Christ. Not to edify means build up. Not just build up in numbers, but to build up in strength, to build up in sincerity. We've had, you know, we, 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 we have all these large congregations falling apart because the members had no strength. And many of them, again, are turning from the gospel completely. The apostasy that must come before, before Messiah, before, before Messiah comes to, bring, call, comes to bring away the worthy. That separation of the self-separation, the goats, the sheep, the, the, the worthy from the unworthy, or the half-hearted from, the, from, the, from those who follow him fully in some cases must occur first and is because they didn't build up the body. They didn't, they built up numbers, large numbers for their own benefit often, huge congregations, but they did not build up the individuals. They may, they may even have, they may have classes, they may have a meet once a week, but you often go to these things. I went to a church that did this. And, the, and these churches, and when you went to these things, they were very shallow, like these cell group stuff. You didn't, they didn't want to talk about the deeper things of God. They, the, the people in there were no different than the pastors. They were about numbers. They wanted to keep their people happy. They wanted to keep them showing up. They did not want to correct them with the rod of the word of God as they, as they should. They did not want to feed them knowledge and understanding. So having all these cell groups and all these groups, they meet weekly on a small basis, is not helpful if they are not feeding them the word of God. But that is what the work of a true pastor does. And the people he puts under him in those kind of arrangements do the same thing. He trains them and they do this. 
And how long is this continued to we're in the unity of faith? And again, it doesn't mean we're in unity with everyone who says they're followers of Yeshua. We're not in unity with people who are teaching false doctrine. We're not in unity with people who are worshiping idols they named Jesus and Mary. The faith, the faith, faith, confidence in what God's word that leads to action. That's the faith it's talking about, the word of God. So we're, so we're in unity with agreement. We're all in agreement with the word of God. So we all come to the knowledge of the, of the Son of Man. And when do we do that? When we're a perfect man, a fully mature man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Remember, in the epistle, of, in one of the epistles of John, it says, as he was in this world, so are we to be. And how do we get there? Through pastors, good pastors, who are emulating the good shepherd and taking care of the flock and feeding and protecting it. Now we're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 17 through 21, and read some more about this work of these pastors who follow the good pa the good shepherd, who emulate him, who do who, who help him, who are under him by doing what he does. Obey them that rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch over for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account they, that they may do of joy and not with grief. For that which is for that is not probable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience, and all things willing to live honestly. And I behold, I beseech you, this rather do, rather do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, to the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work do his will. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, notice who brought us to that great shepherd? Who, who is that great shepherd of the sheep? The Lord Jesus. Remember, the Lord is my shepherd. He's the one, it's his blood that made the everlasting covenant. And he, and it's he that's going to make us fully mature in every good work to do the will of God, the will of the Father. It's he that's working in us that which is well pleasing in the sight. Well, it's the Father, I should say. I'm sorry. It's working in us that is it's well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. He's working in us through Christ to do what's well pleasing in his sight. But he has people helping him. And just a man with a huge in a flock cannot possibly take care of all of it by himself. He'll have under shepherds. And those shepherds are responsible for a smaller flock. It's part of the larger flock. And each one of them is accountable to that great shepherd. That great shepherd is the Messiah. Our pastors are these under shepherds. And they are to rule over. We're to submit ourselves. We're to follow them. Remember, the sheep, the goats refuse to follow the pastor. Now, again, as I've said before, we are to know the word of God ourselves. We're not to follow them away from the word of God. We're to, we're to follow them as they follow Messiah. We're to, we're, 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 to, we're to obey them as they obey Messiah. They are to set the example. We're to follow it. And if they're not setting the example, we're not to follow their bad example. Because ultimately, we are each individually going to answer to God ourselves we're going to, the Lord Jesus, who was raised from the dead, the death, resurrection is the surety. We'll stand before him and have to answer for every deed. And, and, and my chef, my pastor, my pastor said to do this. And I read your word and I knew, and I knew it. I could see they didn't join, but I went to the pastor anyway, is not going to buy, is not going to cut it for you. Okay. You're going to be without excuse if that occurs. But it's talking about following them as they follow God, following them and doing what's right and in doing God, following their examples. They set the right example. And why? They are going to have to watch. For, they are they are to watch to protect your soul. Why? They must give an account for you. Just as she, under shepherd must give an account. If, if he comes back and part of the flock's missing, he has to explain what happened. And it, 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 and. He better have done everything he could to recover that, recover that. Or if, he, if it's beyond this, he better went and got some help. Because he has to answer for that. And they're going to do it with joy. 
And it's not Proverbs that you do this with grief, if they lost a bunch of people, because that means those they lost have been lost forever. If you're among those, if you're among those who would not, or, or a goat, not a sheep, who would not submit yourself to their leading you to follow the word of God, when they fed you, when they fed you with knowledge and understanding, but you would not obey it, you you said, I will not hear it and would not obey it. It's bad news for you for certain. And if they did everything they could and you and you chose to be a goat and not a sheep, that's on you. But their job is to take care of the sheep. They're going to answer for their, how they do that job. And we're going to wrap up here in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. The elders which are among you, I exhort, uh, who am also an elder, a witness of the suffering of Christ, also partake of the glory that should be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. So this is, this is the ultimate motivation for the good pastors to follow the example of Messiah. Now, notice he addresses elders. We talked about them. Elders are one of the helpers. Remember, they help the path. They, they have the congregation in many ways. And as we've mentioned before, they really are God's first choice to do, to, to do, mo to do most things. If, 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 if they'll, if they'll, Convince themselves of the word of God and everything. He doesn't go, you're 60. You know, you're, you're 60, it's kind of over. You know, your, your best years are behind you and stuff. You actually become more valuable if you've been following him, if you've been doing what he says. But, so so these elders are, are either, they either passing themselves, can be passing themselves, or they're helping the pastor. But, they, but what are they helping the pastor with? Feeding the flock. Feeding him. The, old, the pure word of God. Feeding them with knowledge and understanding. Taking oversight thereof. Protecting them. Protecting them. Why? Willingly. Because they care for the flock, not for what they can get out of it. Not by constraint. Not because they were forced to. Not because my dad was a pastor and I had to become a pastor. Or whatever the case is. Not for filthy lucre, but for ready mind. Not because they're seeking the, what the flock can give them, but because they're seeking the good of the flock. Not as being lords over the, God's inheritance. Not being like the bad pastors who ruled with cruelty, who made examples, who wanted to make, who wanted, who wanted to scare people and force people, and particularly, and wanted to get people to, whose only motive was controlling people, ultimately, to make their own lives as comfortable as possible. So they could be asleep on the porch, growing fat off the, off, the, off the efforts of others. Instead, to be examples of the flock. And what's the reward for all this trouble? Because being a shepherd can be a lot of trouble. When the Lord, when the chief shepherd appears, the good shepherd, the, shep the Lord, our shepherd, who's over all of us, they're going to get a crown of glory that fades not away. They're going to get a better place in the kingdom. If they if they can be trusted to take care of take care of take care of people down here that were in their rebellious state, who had flesh that was not saved, that did not have resurrected bodies, they're going to be they're going to be trustworthy to be able to take care of. To help take care of the congregation, the eternal congregation as well. Over people who will not give them all these problems. So I'm going to close with this. Tell you, I'm going to tell you something no, pa no other pastor I know would say. Read the word of God. And, and see if what your pastor says is matching it up. And if it's not, go to him humbly and say to him, look, I saw this, you said this, and they don't seem to match up. And, and, and it could be 
that you, uh, you miss that you, uh, you, uh, you, uh, the cases you're not understanding and he has not and you need feed be fed understanding but listen and see and compare his answer to the word of God if his word if his answer is not based on the word of God it's not one of understanding or if it just doesn't make any sense it doesn't line up with what's written on the on, on plain text or whatever and if that's the case, do not let that pastor lead you into the wolves. Do not let he you you will end up scattered, and so on and so forth. You may have no choice but to appeal to the great shepherd, to the Lord our shepherd, to be your only shepherd. Or you may, or you may have to do like some of the people I talked about, who are currently doing, who are. Who, 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 are being fed by people who are feeding the word of God because they cannot find one locally, but they're feeding them, they're being fed over the internet. And I, I encourage you, we're in the great, apo the, 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 the great apostasy has started, I'll say that. The falling away of many. And it's going to get worse. And do not be one of those that fall away. If your pastor is not feeding you, with knowledge and understanding, find someone that will. Even if it means your only option is, is get the word of God yourself and, and find out yourself. And that's your sole source. Because everyone should be reading it anyways. That's all I got for this week. Until next week. Shalom.